Welcome to Cairo Church of God. We love our church family. We miss you. Um, we're excited, though, about what God is doing. I give God praise for how he is revealing himself to us in special ways, simply because we have more time than ever before. Now, some of our people in our church and around the world and in our city, they are working harder than ever before, and we're praying for them. We're praying for all of... Um, the medical profession, we're praying over them. We're also praying over grocery stores, all the essentials, businesses, we're praying over them. And uh, I know, Leslie, I know that you are working 72 to 80 hours a week. And so we're just praying for you and for all of those that um, is at your job and that you're working with. This morning, we want to just Praise the Lord. I'm going to open with prayer today, and then we're going to go forward into pastor sermon. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. It's an awesome day in you, Lord. We thank you that we're able to come and to worship you freely, Lord. We don't have to be in a church to worship you, Jesus, but we are able to have your presence with us wherever we go. You live within us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You came so that we could have life and we could have it more abundantly, and that's what we're doing today. No matter if we're busy or we're not busy, no matter if we're able to work or we're not, we're not working, Jesus Jesus, you are there. You are our protector. You are our shield. You are our hope. You are our peace. You are our encouragement. And you are our joy today. And we thank you for that in your name. Amen. This morning, some of the scriptures that Pastor will be using in his message comes from Psalm 27. 
The Lord is my revelation, light to guide me along the way. He's the source of my salvation to defend me every day. I fear no one. I'll never turn back and run from you, Lord. Surround and protect me. If you look, this is in Psalm 27, and if you go to verse 3, I love this. My heart will not be afraid, even if an army rises to attack. We are in a war, like it or not. It is different than anything we've ever experienced before. But Jesus has not left us. We have people who are on the front lines in the medical profession and essential businesses. But we're believing those who are not doing that we are praying for you we are interceding for you those who are not on the front we hey we may be like more on the back lines but we're praying and we're interceding and i challenge you today church church family friends whoever is watching we need to be praying daily all throughout the day whenever the lord impresses you you need to be rising early in the morning talking to the Lord, praying for those intercede. They are depending on us to intercede in the name of Jesus. If you go to down to verse four, here's one thing I crave from God. The one thing I seek above all else. I want the privilege of living with him every moment in his house. I want the privilege of living with him every moment in his house. Now, where is the temple? We know our body is the temple. And so I just want the privilege of being with him, having me being aware of his presence on a daily basis. You are not alone today. No matter if you are watching from a hospital room, no matter if you are watching from your home and you have no family or friends over, you're not alone. He is with you. And he has people who are praying for you. He, Jesus is actually interceding on your behalf today. Pastor is going to come now and bring forth the message. I just encourage you today, connect with him. And when you connect with him and you get in his presence, really all fear does leave. All fear is gone and in its place because our faith rises up connect with him today. I love you all. God bless you for watching. I believe that God has a word for us. No matter what season we're in, currently we're in the coronavirus pandemic season, but I'm believing God to help us all, even though our hearts go out to people who really have a terrible time with that, and particularly uh, the people who uh, are lost to that uh, terrible disease. And we look at all the circumstances around us, uh, whether uh, things are kind of shut down for a period of time, but it won't always be like it is right now. Let me ask you a question. How are you dealing with uncertainty and when you're not sure what tomorrow's going to bring or how long it will be before the circumstance that you're having to manage is going to be over? We're going to look at that today. And God has a word for you. And let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the privilege we have to look into the Word of God and hear you speak to us from your Word. Not the words I necessarily speak, but from the Bible itself. You have a Word for us, which is your will for our lives. I pray, God, that you would help us to heed your Word. Pay attention to it. Treasure it, or in the King James Version, hide your Word in our hearts. Uh, so that we might not sin against you in the Bible. That's right. When we, when we treasure your word in our hearts, Lord, that is a life-changing kind of faith. And we thank you for helping us with that every day of our lives. And we thank you for being the God who is moved by prayer and the God who has compassion upon his people. And we thank you for all of your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Cairo Church of God, a wonderful church that I've been privileged to serve as pastor for all now going on close to 25 years. God has blessed me and blessed our church, but we love all the places that we've pastored. And this is the fourth church that I've been privileged to pastor. My first church was in Greston, Georgia uh, from 1980 to 1983. And then it was in Lenox, Georgia 
uh, from 1984 to 1986. And then it was at West Green where I actually was raised uh, at, from uh, 1986 to 1996 and I've been here uh, since 1996 and it's now 2020. I cannot say enough but how how grateful I am for our church and how grateful I am that you're watching. God has a word for you. I really believe that. This is Psalm 27 and in Psalm 27 verses 1 through 4 and I'm going to share this with you in, in a version you may not be familiar with called God's Word version. That was one of the favorite Bible versions that I've read through. Uh, you learn things and you grow uh, through that particular Bible version. But I'm going to share this passage of scripture with you in God's Word version. Psalm 27 beginning with verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who is there to fear? The Lord is my life's fortress. Who is there to be afraid of? Evil doers closed in on me to tear me to pieces. My opponents and enemies stumbled and fell. Even though an army sets up camp against me, my heart will not be afraid. Even though a war breaks out against me, I will still have confidence in the Lord. I've asked one thing from the Lord. This will I seek to remain in the Lord's house, or we could say in the Lord's presence, because that's what it kind of represented to uh, David the psalmist here. Uh, to remain in the Lord's house or presence all the days of my life in order to gaze at the Lord's beauty and to search for an answer in his temple. Do you know what God's will is for your life? It is like Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house or the presence of the Lord forever. That's the King James Version. That's God's will for your life. How are you doing with God's will for your life? And when we look at Psalm 27, I have somebody made a statement that it was the Bible's great cure for times of uncertainty and adversity. You having some of those? The world is having some of those right now. And... This is a psalm of what it looks like and what it means to have great faith and confidence in the Lord in spite of overwhelming adversity and circumstances. In this instance, from human opposition, but in life it's all kinds of opposition, including these pandemics or epidemics that, that, that we have to manage from time to time. Not an easy set of circumstances. This first, the first half of Psalm 27 it, it shows us an attitude of confidence in God. And it's based on the fact that the psalmist had this humility to rely upon the Lord. And, and when, that's what we find in the last part of the psalm. And so we look at, at this message today and it's entitled, Life's Greatest Things, or we would say the greatest things in life. What are the greatest things in life? If I were to ask you, what would you, could you name several of those? Would it be enough money, security, wonderful family, great future? Well, those things are probably important to us all. But we're going to look at the greatest things in life from the Bible's perspective, particularly here in Psalm 27. In, in Psalm 27, one of life's greatest things is, is it's life's greatest knowledge. Maybe you have a lot of degrees and that's wonderful. God bless you. And uh, that, that's amazing that you could accomplish that. And that's, that's incredible. And uh, have a great deal of respect for that. But there are many people who have degrees and they have a lot of knowledge and can share a great many facts. But in Psalm 27, verse one, the psalmist tells us about life's greatest knowledge and says there, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Who is there to fear? The Lord is my life's fortress. Who is there to be afraid of? Verse three, even though an enemy sets up camp against me, my heart, will not be afraid even though a war breaks out against me. I will have confidence in the Lord. 
there were a lot of things that the psalm writer didn't know, just like there's a lot of things we don't know. He didn't know exactly what today or tomorrow might bring or next week. And just like everyone else, just like you, just like me, the psalmist had problems in life. But the psalmist, David here, shepherd king of Israel, he knew one thing. He knew that the Lord himself, the Lord God, I think in Yahweh here, was his light and salvation and the defense of his life. Is that what the Lord is to you? He can be if, if he is not. He wants to be if you'll let him. This is being, re being recorded in April, two, uh, excuse me, this is being recorded in April 2020. And, and, and it just looks as though the holidays are passing by. Easter's, you know, it's coming up and and that's going to be wonderful, but we're, we can't be in our building. I don't particularly think it's wise to meet even uh, at, at, in your cars at church right now. But that's everybody's to their own opinion. The United States has been through wars, been through epidemics such as polio when I was in grammar school and they didn't ask me anything, just said line up and they gave me a polio shot. And I never had polio, even though it was horrific at, at that time. The United States has been two, through two world wars, been through the Great Depression, been through terrorist attacks that destroyed the World Trade Centers in New York City. And in all these times, our nation recovered. Our nation kept moving forward. Who could have imagined a disease such as the coronavirus could do so much damage in such a short time to so many nations, shutting entire countries down. You may think that uh, I'm impervious. I'm, I'm able to take care of myself. It doesn't take a lot for us to realize within ourselves we are insufficient. You know, let me ask you a question. How are you reacting to life circumstances? I hope you're not one of those people that are just complaining all the time, have a bad attitude all the time, if you do, when you do that, you're just going to ruin your whole day. Yeah, I, I shared this with a, with a class uh, at my granddaughter's school some years ago about how your words and attitudes determine your weather. For instance, if you're in a vehicle and it has an air conditioner, it may be very hot outside, but it'll be cool inside that vehicle. On the other hand, if it's freezing outside and the heater works, you'll be nice and warm in that vehicle because you control the temperature. Well, that's what your words do. They control your temperature. You have to be very careful about what you say in times of adversity especially. I would encourage you, don't whine, don't grumble, don't quarrel, don't argue, don't have to have, listen, don't have the last word. You're going to be blessed if you can learn to do that. And, and when on the other hand, what you could do is take a lesson from the psalmist in Psalm 27. You may say, well, that's thousands of years ago. Well, it may be. But the truth in the Bible, even if it's in Genesis, the first book in the Bible, or probably Job, in my opinion, which I have read was the oldest book in the Bible, that might have been thousands and thousands of years ago. But the truth of God is relevant whether it is in the, book of Gen in the book of Genesis, in the Bible, the first book in the Old Testament, or the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book in the New Testament. You, how are you and your family managing the coronavirus? Some people may panic, and if it gets bad enough, that is a human reaction. And some may complain. We don't like being shut in. We don't like being able to not, not be able to go shop at stores or, or take trips or, or have family reunions and celebrations like Easter egg hunts and all the other part of, of uh, this season and maybe Mother's Day. Let me tell you about Easter Sunday. It won't matter what the date is. The first Sunday we're back in our building in the sanctuary, that's going to be a big time Easter Sunday for Cairo Church of God. I hope that whenever 
churches are open and you can go back to church even if you don't go to church get in one somewhere start going to church and let God speak to your heart he has a word for you there as well and so our first Sunday is going to be Easter Sunday it doesn't matter so I heard somebody say that some pastor has said if it was July 4th it was going to be Easter Sunday at their, at their church it probably would be for us too uh, listen the Lord is a light you know what a light does a light provides a sense of, of direction and safety so you know which way to go and how to walk safely and so when you talk about life's greatest knowledge and it is the fact that you know the Lord as your light and your salvation let me ask you a question what is life's greatest question the psalmist had an answer for life's greatest question what is life's greatest the answer to life's greatest question in Acts 16, there was a jailer there, Paul and Silas, who were at that time in ministry and serving the Lord. They had been falsely imprisoned, beaten, whipped in stocks, probably in total darkness in an inner Roman prison. And some people would have complained because of their circumstances. But the Bible says about midnight, they begin to pray and sing praises to God. You know what happened? The prisoners heard them, the Bible says. And then near the end of that chapter, this hardened jailer comes to them and asks them life's greatest question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? If you're not saved, if, if you haven't committed your life to Christ, you haven't asked God to forgive you of your sins, that's the greatest question you could ask. What should you do or what must you do in order to be saved? You know, the psalmist said this is what he was going to do. He wanted to remain in the Lord's house or presence so he could always gaze at the Lord's beauty and to, and to search for an answer or to inquire in his temple. What must, what must I do to stay in the Lord's presence or be in the Lord's presence? You know, what must I do to get into the presence of God and stay in the presence of God? You know, that's where the psalmist wanted to be. How about you? I'll, it's really just as simple as ABC, and I didn't come up with this. You can find this all over the Internet. Sounds like something Billy Graham would have used. ABC, this is the answer. To how serves what must I do to be saved in Acts 16? Well, it's just like ABC. First of all, A is admit you have sinned. In Romans 3.23, Paul was writing the, the same apostle Paul we were talking about in that prison. He, the Holy Spirit was actually writing through him. And this is what the Bible says there in the New King James Version. For all have sinned and come or fallen short of the glory of God. Admit you're a sinner. And I like to tell you, after you get saved, you'll never sin, but uh, I'm working on that part. I hadn't got that part down yet. But we all need a Savior. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the B. For God so loved the world, that's people, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever so, so, whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then the, the, the next verse after it said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the Amplified Bible, that word believe is amplified to say, to trust in and rely on and cling to. That's what faith is. It is relying on Christ. It is trusting in Christ, and it is clinging to Christ. And the C stands for confess Christ publicly. If you've ever watched the Billy Graham crusade, and I've always thought if you wanted to hear the gospel, watch a Billy Graham, a Billy Graham uh, crusade, uh, a tape, a video, uh, a message, uh, and you would hear the gospel. And he would get to the end of his message, and he would then call eventually for people to come forward public. He was publicly, he'd say, why do I ask people to come forward publicly? Because that's what Christ did. And you, you want to be able to confess Christ publicly. The Lord Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. 
Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart, that's to believe, trust in and rely on and cling to, uh, this is a life-changing kind of faith. This is not lip service. In the Old Testament, God's people worshiped him with, with just their, their, their words. And he said, in vain do these people worship me with their lips, for their heart is far from me. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart, one believes, it's a life-changing belief, unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. And when we look at life's greatest things, the third one is life's greatest need. You know, and this is verses 7 and 8 in that same chapter, Psalm 27. Hear, O Lord, New King James Version. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy upon me and answer me. You ever have prayed a def desperate prayer like that? When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, will I seek. We need to call upon the Lord in prayer. That's life's greatest, one of life's greatest needs. Let me ask you a question. How much do you pray? I read about a guy who was gambling on horses. I'm not sure that the Lord really is interested in that much, except probably not happy with it, I would assume. So he's, he's praying, or not, he was calling on the Lord, and his horse was not winning. And suddenly, near the end of the race, this horse he had bet money on, it pulled out ahead, and just before he crossed the, the finish line, he said, thanks, Lord, I got it by myself now. Is that the only kind of prayer you pray? I hope you pray regardless of that. How much do you pray, and then do you pray at all? You know what the Bible says, prayer to God is a very powerful tool. And then what it does, it's like a weapon that helps you overcome uh, uncertainty and adversity. Uh, in, uh, in James 5, 16, the last part of that, the King James Version says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I think it is the New Century Version that says, when a believing person prays, great things happen. So you ought to pray. Y'all learn to pray. I had to make myself learn to pray when I got saved. Listen, make up your mind about God. In verse 14 in Psalm 27, wait and hope for and expect the Lord. Be brave and of good courage and let your heart be stout and enduring. Yes, wait for and hope for and expect the Lord. You know, what the everyday life study Bible says, this is directly from the Everyday Life Study Bible by Joyce Meyer. Quoting, How foolish we are to spend our lives seeking those things that cannot satisfy while we ignore God. The one, th the, the one thing who can give us great joy, peace, satisfaction, and contentment, except he's a he and not a thing. The world is filled with empty people who are trying to satisfy the void in their lives with the latest model car, a promotion at work, a human relationship, a vacation, or some other thing. Their efforts to find fulfillment to, in those things never work. It is sad that so many people waste their entire lives and never realize it. They never know the joy of seeking the one thing they really need. Listen to this. This is what that study Bible says. One of the most amazing statements that I probably have ever read in any commentary. And this is what that Bible says. Each one of us has a God-shaped hole inside. And nothing can fill it except God himself. No matter what else we try to fill it with, we remain empty and frustrated. If you will put him first in everything you do, how good are you doing with that? You will be so, you'll be so blessed. Investing your life in God is the very best thing you can do. God bless you for listening. God has a word for you. Be wise. And remember the greatest things in life. It all is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. And it's the knowledge that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Admit you're a sinner if you're not saved. Believe on him with life-changing faith and confess Christ publicly as your Lord and Savior. May the Lord bless you 
and, and keep his hand upon us all and upon our nation as we go through this very difficult time with the coronavirus and especially bless those people who are providing health care on the front lines of care, whether it's EMTs, sometimes law enforcement, certainly nurses and doctors and the people who work in hospitals and places like that or clinics. May the Lord bless them and may the Lord bless you for watching today. God bless you. Hope you have a great week.